Hi. Hello. I love you. So good to be with you. In case you're wondering. I'm like a fan, but a friend and a supervisee, an old school supervisee. So I, okay. So I was just walking my dog. So I've been like, so, so exhausted all day. I was at a funeral of a dear, a memorial of a dear friend this weekend. Mm -hmm. And I've been so tired all day. And I'm like, I'm just not going to be able to like show up Uh as my best self for this podcast with Brad Reedy. Mm. And then as I was just walking my dog before the podcast, I thought, maybe that's the point right. <laughs> of all the people to not be able to show up as your true self mm. with, or your best self. I'm showing up as my true self, but not as my best self. I really want to hear every, basically I was like, well, you have him on the podcast. You may as well have him untangle this with you today because right. everybody feels this way. <laughs> yeah, we do. Don't we? Well, and I don't know. And the purpose of this podcast, I mean, that's the stuff that makes you go binge eat and isolate and cut on yourself is like, right. at least for me, when I'm like pretending and I'm putting all right. this energy towards being my best self and then beating myself up after this, like that was such a bad podcast. So I was like, Hey, why don't you just tell Brad how you're feeling and then see if he can untangle it. And, you know, <laughs> but I also want to talk about narcissism. So like, we're just going to yeah. put that on the list of things. All right. We'll get around to it. I'm sure. <laughs> what do you think of that, Brad? I think it's the dilemma of our lives, you know, to, to, to figure out how to show up and be okay with who we are is the whole thing to be okay with who we are. And I, you know, I, I've been, I mean, I think about this all the time, but I've been thinking about it a lot lately, very specifically about making sure we spend as much time as we can with people who can accept how we are, who we are in the moment. And then that, that that then we carry that around with us so that we can show up in more places more more authentically but um i think that's you know, I, really I, I could talk brilliant. about that that first question for for hours and hours and hours because it's the it's the thing of life i'm so glad that we're i mean just for people who like get friends like this because i almost feel like it would i mean i'm i've done a lot of work because uh-huh. brad reedy says a therapist who hasn't done their work go get yeah. another therapist Really, right? Oh, yeah. I always say that to people. Ask your therapist yeah. if they're in therapy and if they're not run away. Right, right. Um, but I thought to myself, and this is a really healthy thought. So, you know, if you're listening, like, you know, it takes practice. I thought, what a sin to the friendship to right. pretend like you're okay. Right. And by the way, to my listener, because I think like my authenticity is really part of my brand, you know? Absolutely. I think your listeners experience a relationship with you in, in, in so many ways. I think they carry like, like my listeners, like oh, my listeners talking. experience a relationship with you too. Yeah. <laughs> I channel you every minute. They carry it around with them. They carry around that feeling that, that, that who they are is okay because you show them. I mean, my therapist says so often, she says, we're just teaching people how to be a person and nobody mm-hmm. taught them that they told them how to be a, a good something or other. And really this, this, the purpose of life is your life is who you are is expressing your unique self to the world. And, um, we learn very early that that's sometimes too much or too little or not quite right. So we hide it. And then we end up with symptoms to medicate the, the feelings that come from dampening that authentic self, that, that real self. And so, you know, one thing I love about you, Molly is every time we talk in whatever capacity it is, I immediately feel safe with you in the first 10 seconds of just reconnecting with you. I, I know that virtually any I, anything I say from an honest place is going to be just okay because that's how you you are. Yeah. I mean, it's just revered. I feel the same way. Gosh, and I, I hope everybody can find a friend like that. I There are so many. I was just thinking of all the different times I've talked to you this year. Like sometimes just like, do you have four minutes to set mm-hmm. my head straight? I didn't talk to you in four months. You're like, yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Talk to you now. So like can we run down this thing that I was about to do and maybe what was going on? I, I think the idea of like, you know, like, is it, I love, is that a codependent response I was having, you know, what was happening? And cause I think this happens to a lot of people. Like I even just think of it so simply like around the holidays, right? right. Like 
well, I, you know, I can't be sad around my family, like, or like, you know, I can't go to this event and I have to just like put on a happy face. I have to show up big, you know? And I know for me, it's usually about like people, you know, rejecting me or you know, the right. shame of rejection or the shame of abandonment. But I wonder like, you know, what do you think about that? And then like maybe more of a solution. I mean, I think it is, I think it is codependency, but, but maybe beneath that or, or really what that looks like is that you haven't had experience in your life where you could show up, say what's on your mind, say what you're feeling, be who you are in that moment, whatever level of energy, and the people around you were okay with it. Right. So it's it's how we, ex especially in the formative years, especially with our caregivers and the adults in our life and early years, it's how we experience and see ourselves in the moments that we're with them. It's 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 We see ourselves through their eyes. We see who we are through their eyes. And so I was thinking about when you were just talking that many years ago, I was in New York and I was going to see a show, The Book of Mormon. Oh, and that that's a whole night, podcast. that night, my best friend, uh, for my entire life was possibly dying. Mm -hmm. And I had met him in the missionary MTC. I was a Mormon years ago in another life. And I had met him in the MTC and we became best friends. And I was crying the entire time. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to hide it because the people with me were enjoying the show, of right, course, laughing. as they should. And yeah. I felt guilty for the most authentic, real grief that anybody would have connected to. Probably the best thing would have been to not go to the show that night, but I didn't know how it was going to trigger me. But I remember thinking I have to hide the potential loss of my best friend this evening being triggered by this show so that everybody around me can just have a good night. In fact, Sofia Coppola was sitting to my left, so she might have noticed my, my tears running down my face. But I think it's what we do. It's it's how we survive. And then that becomes a pattern that we call codependency. But I think it's about an attachment wound where um, we weren't connected to and held and seen and validated in the moments that we weren't whatever we whatever whatever talents whatever whatever gifts that we have when we weren't those things um we weren't really connected to and so we walk around just not quite being sure if we show up in the next situation if it's going to be okay mm. if it's going to be rejected if it's going to be uh grounds for dismissal if you will okay. i want to um so we're saying you know this is like i love my Brad Reedy time, like two therapists walk into a bar. We just get right to it. I'd have to yeah. say that. I love that about us. Um, but I just want to break down some of the language we're using for people listening. So can we break down? I mean, and first of all, we're saying like a lot of this comes from your childhood, right? Because okay. that's where the right. DNA started. That's where the fingerprints are made. Right. But the second thing you're saying is like, it's an attachment wound. So what's yeah. an attachment wound? Ideally, let's talk about what an attachment is, a healthy, secure attachment is first. It is having a, a capable, secure, a safe person, somebody who made you feel safe and welcomed. Mm. And so if you had that consistently, not perfectly, but overall, if you had that consistency, you experience yourself as okay. When the child, when you're out playing with a toddler and they trip and fall, they look back at the, the caregiver, the parent, the mother, the father, to see how they should feel. So that's how children think is they see themselves the way the parents see them. I mean, our inner voices um, are the feelings and thoughts that our parents had toward us. We begin to, it's not what they Ooh. say to us. That's just, that's just Tomorrow's the tip of the therapy iceberg. sessions already getting deeper, Brad. That's so a, that's really the attachment fracture is when we were too much. Mm -hmm. We caused them fear, or anxiety. They called it love, but it caused them fear, or anxiety or frustration disappointment anytime you you know a parent or, or a person really is disappointed frustrating or, or, or upset with somebody they have lost contact with that person mm. because if you really understood somebody right at the deepest level you would have empathy for them we know that from our own experiences that once you get to know somebody and their their unique history and their dilemma you just you just love them and understand what they're come where they're coming from so it's about the fractured attachment the attachment wound is about being disconnected about not being seen, not mm -hmm. being helped, not being welcomed. And then we find that we have to dance and we have to do all these things to kind yeah. of entertain the people to, to, to belong in that place. We have to not not frown when we're when we're sad and not eat when we're hungry or whatever it is we have to do so that people find us acceptable. Mm -hmm. And and that's that behavior is trying to repair the attachment experience that we had that we were too much or too little of something. That's fast. I always think of this client and she's me 
and she was desperate to get married and she was dating a doctor, a doctor, you know, and he had a motorcycle and he, it was her third date. She just, all she wanted to do, you know, was have him love her yeah. and the motorcycle was on her leg and she got a third degree burn rather mm -hmm. than say the motorcycle is burning my leg. I right. do. This is me like that. That story is like, I don't judge that story. I, no. I namaste, namaste, third degree burn motorcycle. Yes. But that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, that's what yeah. we're trained to do. I have to suffer, betray myself, which that, that my motorcycle experience is a, is a self betrayal. I have to betray myself because I learned that when I was young, that when I was who I was, things didn't go well. People got upset or, or alarmed, but if I betray myself, then I'll be welcome. Then I'll be, then I'll have a place. Then I'll be loved. And and it sounds dramatic. And you you know you're you and I are thinking about things with very very the the the, the fine print the, the the small brush strokes. But that's that's the process. No, I think it's that's. I mean, and so I mean because that's Marsha Linehan writes that. You know, she says mm -hmm. the function of shame is to avoid rejection, and it always right. resonates with me right. deeply. I mean, I think Absolutely. that's. I would rather sit and think that I'm the problem than even consider that other people just do it before they would do it to me. It's like literally, you know, I was bullied as a fact because there's so many. I mean, so many things. So this idea of like, so my first question is, what if somebody's sitting here with like. And it, like struggling with, you know, addiction or eating disorder, you know, whatever life, <laughs> right, right, life, and thinking, well, I had such a good childhood. I, my loved, my parents loved me. They were amazing. They did, you know, like then what do we like? So there's some people being like, oh yeah, my childhood totally, totally. But then what about these ones saying, no, 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 everything was great. Therapy can fix that. <laughs> 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 my, my best friend went to therapy it happened to her she was like oh my dad was really angry. there was a line out of my <laughs> my therapist's most recent book and it wasn't even a really complicated or profound line but it was this case story that she was saying case study that she was sharing and it was something as simple as the you know the the, the gentleman in front of me in her therapist's office never realized how painful his childhood was it was that <laughs> simple that unremarkable but part of what happens when you wake up is you become sensitive to the things that you had to. This is interesting, I think, Molly. You have to repress the, 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 the more complete awareness of your childhood because the awareness of your childhood threatens the parent. Right. We, I, we need to break that down a, or threatens like your existence. Right. So right. in order to have an acceptance that like, oh, yeah, you know what? My dad was really angry and now I get really angry or I'm totally freaked out by anger. Right. It's a really dangerous thing Absolutely. in a way, right? Absolutely. And, and I talk about the, the aversion to looking back or looking critically at our childhoods. And when I say critically, I mean carefully. Mm. I mean honestly. Mm. Is that we're, we're still carrying around our, our parents' ego. We're still supporting the lack of work that they did to fall in love with their horrible rotten self because right. they never made peace with it. And so we have to believe and think and feel certain things for for them to be okay for then for like you said for then us to survive because if they're not okay our very existence is in jeopardy for sure so the the the, the heroic journey the heroic task of looking at yourself looking at your childhood confronting the 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 rules i even wrote the other day that the the stigmatizing of therapy in general is a trauma response oh my god i love i was sort of thinking before the podcast well before I, you know, was exhausted and sad and right. was going to bring my fake self to it. But I was thinking, gosh, what, what if I did all the things I love that he posts that I was like, that's like 17. I mean, if you're not following Brad Reedy mm. and you're even into an nth of what we're talking about, please stop what you're doing and mm. go do that. Your stuff is, it's so good. And it's so brave and it's so right. Right. So you're saying that people who poo poo themselves at therapy, it's a function that yeah. they don't want to look at their stuff. It very simply put, that instinct is probably, I, 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 there's other uh, explanations I'm sure, but it's probably to protect mom and dad's ego, mm -hmm. which is probably to preserve their, their, their safety because if mom and dad go away, the baby, the child dies, the ch child suffers. So you're protecting yourself, but you're protecting the ego of the parents because a whole parent, right? A human parent, a, 
a parent who's a person would welcome the love, the anger, right. the sadness, the grief, the downtimes, the uptimes and all of it. But when a parent has to be good, then a child has to think that the parent is good and then they have to sacrifice. They have to allow the, the, the exhaust pipe on the motorcycle to burn their legs at any cost. I just literally wrote that word down, yeah. sacrifice. That's really yeah. what I was hearing. Like we are taught in yeah. um, attachment wounded relationships to sacrifice or to right. run if you're talking about an avoidant attachment, which right, is another right. kind. Did you, did you ever read the book Attached? I don't know if I have. It sounds it's real pop culture. I'm just saying if you're sitting here with us listening and being like, oh, I need more of it, like attached to such a quick, easy read on attachment mm -hmm. theory. And it really helps to understand like how you are in relationships, which <clears throat> analysis paralysis, though very important. I know, Brad, you've trained me well, mm -hmm. but it does help to make it not feel so crazy and maybe make there be a route to this that oh, you sure. can overcome. Absolutely. I think it's that's imperative that you feel like there's a route to it that you understand. I was just thinking about it today about meeting with a client that you, you have to first understand how you're dented, how you're bruised before you can start to care for it, treat it um, to, to address the wound. So you have yeah. to. You have yeah. to understand how you're dented and bruised. And sometimes yeah. that's a really scary proposition. Yeah. Like I don't want to look at it. That's what people say to me all the time. I think we said this on our last podcast, like People say to me, like, you know, if I, if I stop my addiction, then I'm really going to have to deal with some problems. And right, I just yeah. don't want to do that. If I yeah. stop my addiction or heal my addiction, rather, please strike all the record on that before. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, if I heal my addiction, I'm probably gonna have to get divorced. Right. If I heal my addiction, like, I don't even know what's underneath it. It's too scary for me. Like, what do you think about that? It's fascinating. I mean, that's the, that's the, the, the the story the story is if i cross that threshold if i cross from the known which is the way i'm living my life right now to the unknown i will surely die yeah you know that's why the the symbol the symbols of going into the cave or going into the the deep dark forest that's why they're there because those represent the unknown and the possible calamity that could occur and so to, to walk you, you know I, I always say like the door is six or eight feet away from me it took me in some examples in my life, it took me years to be able to walk through the door in my life when it was right there. But I was sure I saw dead bodies, metaphorically speaking, uh, across the thread, threshold that told me that anybody who tried to cross that threshold, tell their truth, be who they are, whatever it is, that they didn't make it. And so I just know that I can't do it the other way because I've been conditioned to believe this is the way you have to live. I have to believe. I have to behave this way right. or I won't survive. What What do you think that's a function of just not just, but that's a, it's a complete function of fear and programming. It is the parents saying, if you go outside, if you draw outside, color outside of the lines, you are a bad kid and bad kids deserve nothing. They deserve to be alone. Is it always the parent though? I think sometimes it's a abuser well, maybe, or an aunt. I don't know. My, I have an uncle. I mean, I have plenty of trauma. I have trauma to fill the days as do you, mm -hmm. but I had this uncle once who said this really thing to me and somehow it tattooed me and made me believe I was like a liar and too much, you know, and it, I had to do right. a lot of, it's funny. Like when you're sitting in the work, you know, I don't know if this happened to you sitting in the work, you think it's this one thing. And then you're like, Oh, uncle Philip. Okay. Well, let's do that one then. Here we are. Yeah. I, I have one of those from my grandfather still. Yeah. I was walking in and, and I was probably 12 and he said, I was starting to look like a blimp. That's what he said. Oh boy. And I'll never forget that moment. I'm traumatized I mean, from that by proxy. It, bring, it you know brings tears to my eyes. Yeah, me too. Um, but there's some, I mean, and I also have on the other side, I have an uncle who filled in for my father who was absent and he wasn't there every day, but he took me to games and he spent time with me and he loved me and he, just allowed me to be a kid and his kind of surrogate son. And I had a sixth grade teacher, Mr. McKechnie, who made a difference in my life and I'm still in contact with him. And so you can do both, it, yeah. you know, other people, but that person who's there every day is, they have the biggest opportunity to do to do well or, or to do harm for sure. And one thing we do know, Molly, is that if, the atta if there is an attachment that's secure, um, assault, one. <laughs> yeah, one, that's consistent. 
I know this is, the, I was listening to your podcast on this. I listen, I made everybody who works for me listen. Abuse, it. circumstances, um, big T trauma often, often don't leave the same mark. So if my grandfather had said that and my mother was in the room at the time, had said something to him and I felt safe with her, it would have been a different experience for me. It would have been crazy um, dysfunctional grandpa. But for me, because it was an alone moment mm -hmm. of me just having to wear that myself and my mother being as scared of him as I was, that it left its mark. And so there is something that we can do as caregivers, parents, even if you're an uncle or a teacher or a therapist that can contribute to the resiliency of people. Mm -hmm. but parents are, you know, the first line of defense. They're the first, the first options, but media peers, even siblings. One thing I think I have under taught about over the years is the effect of an unhealthy or an abusive sibling on a child mm -hmm. or a loving and a supportive sibling on a child too. And wow. so I think it's all there, but parents are kind of the, the big ones, the big, the big, the big T's. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about, okay. Now everybody's like, okay, guys, <laughs> <laughs> this is just us getting started. I have it. <laughs> right. What do I do? And we can't say to them, because my, you know, I just always bring my angriest, sickest self everywhere with me, especially when I'm talking right. to geniuses. We can't say to them, go find your people. That's invalidating. We have to teach them how, and it's really scary to find your people. I've been friends with you for a million years. You're the most, I feel exactly the same way about you as you. I think our commerce and our friendship yep. is that if I didn't bring my best, if I brought my fake self, you'd be like, are you okay? Right, right. <laughs> What's right. happening there? Why do you hate Absolutely. me? Um, so I think to be your authentic self is really scary when you've been trained with an, with an attachment wound or just been trained that you're not enough or too much or all those things. So can we yeah. break it down into parts? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the, I wrote this the other day, the, the, you have to find, I think you have to find somebody. What if you're too scared you to, to, what's that? What if you're too scared to, uh, it, well, that person that you can find can be the voice on the podcast. Okay. It can be. Look at you. Book. You're really digging. I appreciate it. <laughs> it can be a book that you read. I mean, one of the things okay. I loved, I loved about the podcast, Molly, about doing it myself was I reached people who wouldn't go to therapy because mm. exactly what you're saying. It was too hard, too scary. Um, so, okay. you know, I have a relationship with authors. I have a relationship with you through the podcast, I have a relationship I, with other people. No, I speak to you not often. I speak to you almost every day. If you work for me, I'm like, well, here's what I think Brad Reedy would say right here. Uh, All yeah. the time. That That is a very common thing. You and like Marsha Linehan. I'm like, I really think the Brad Reedy of this, that's actually, I've made it into its own phraseology. I'm like, well, the Brad Reedy of this is that you need to really sit there and accept them exactly as they are. And that's the therapy today. That's what yeah. I'll say a lot. Is that right? Is that I the Brad so. Reedy of it? My funny that you asked that and kind of reminded me that sometimes it's too scary because I always say the goal of the podcast and the books that I write are so that people will, will find a therapist, an adequate therapist and spend as much time with them for as long as they can. Mm -hmm. If, if it's not that I can, it's not that the books will, will take you to the end, but the books will invite you into a, a process of being in relationship with somebody that you'll recognize, um, you'll recognize what we're describing. You'll recognize somebody who's capable, somebody who can securely, you know, create a, 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 a reparative experience to your attachment. So sit in the back of the class, sit in your own car, listening to the podcast on your ears, but find people to spend time around who can see all of you, not just the pretty parts and the talented and the smart parts, but all of you and be okay with it. And after a while you start to realize, I know what I'm looking for in a friend and a partner for, for 40 years, Molly, I didn't know what to look for in a friend or a partner because I had so little experience with it. And I was so slow to learn it in therapy about what it was like to have somebody across from me that was a capable human adult. And I only learned that not from the books that I read, although they, they helped. I learned that from the experience of sitting across from a capable, healthy adult. Yeah. JD's great. But what yep. happens? This is what's my experience because I deal with so much diet trauma and a really common theme in diet trauma is people, I'm so actually so excited to hear what you think about this. So people hiring coaches, therapists who end up 
victim shaming them. And by that, I mean, yeah. you know, sort of making it like, hey, like this is your fault. You're not trying hard enough or the things I've heard in my years is just endless. And so I wonder, like, what do you think of that? Because you're like, yeah, find a great therapist. But I think when you're in this vulnerable tr trauma attachment wounded space and you're, by the way, getting Instagram messages like I can save your life. And then right. you're sitting there and they're saying, which I've heard from a coach, my favorite one you know, the common denominator in all these diets is you and you're the problem. And this is right. what we need to fix. It's like, what are we to do? And especially with the saturation of social media, what are we to do to find the people? You know, the best way to find somebody is to tell them, I mean, I, I'm going to say this and then we'll go back to even if you can't do this, because okay. that'll be your I next you question. I'm I love sure. you for everything. Well, I'm nothing. I'm not reliable, Brad. Um, you tell them how they feel about what they've said and if they can apologize, regroup and 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 try to show up in a better way, then you have a good friend, a good mentor, a good sponsor, a good coach, good therapist. Yeah. If they make you the problem, and what that sounds like is saying, um, well, you're misinterpreting or that's just your depressed self or that's just your, your, you know, your bipolar or your borderline or whatever, or your narcissistic self, then you know you have a therapist that hasn't made peace with themselves and you're sitting across from a compromised person who needs to be the good one. They can't hold space for you. Um, so that's the, mm, that's Brad, what that's we do. That's so good we, though. I actually love that. It's like, I always think like, you know, healers are humans. Yeah. And maybe going into each relationship, being more curious. I think what ends up happening, at least in my experience personally, it's like, I want someone to save me. I don't even understand that I have something in me that I can heal myself. And so if you're going in, in that space, it's unlikely you're going to come out or you're probably attracting those vultures. Oh, I, I think I, I have to spend as much time telling clients, I'm not going to kick your ass. I'm not going to beat you up mm -hmm. because they, they think that that's love. They don't know mm -hmm. that love is patient, kind, compassionate. Another thing that, to look for is if you were to tell um, a mentor, a sponsor, a coach, a therapist that you were upset or hurt by something they said, what you really are listening for is somebody to say, I'm so glad that you said that. I'm sure in your past, when you've told authority figures, when you were upset, that it was, that didn't go well. And so the fact that you would take the risk with me and tell me how you felt, I'm honored by it. Thank you for telling me, keep mm -hmm. going. Yeah. If you hear that, don't leave, <laughs> right. stick with that person. <laughs> Oh, it's so true. I've heard, yeah, too nice, too nice, too nice. Yeah. Um, but what if you're sitting there and the coach is saying, you know, you're the problem and like you believe it? I yeah. guess that we're already answering that. But what do you I think mean, of that? What I mean, that's why, I, uh, that's why I, that's why I know it sounds silly. That's one of the reasons why I'm on Instagram and I do a podcast is because I'm not in, you know, I, I, I'm not talking to these folks, but maybe somebody will read something. You know, I have, I have a, in my, one of my books and I post it on Instagram now and again about what to look for in a therapist. Yeah. I love those. It kind There's of like lists five. that. It's like, yeah, it's, it's a slide one. It's so I would good. write, I would just love for somebody to read that and say, oh my gosh, I could never tell my therapist that I was frustrated with them because I know when I have in the past, they've kind of bullied me back mm. and then they might look for something else. They might say, because you don't even know, you don't even know that that's a healthy relationship because you, you, you're you convinced we are taught by our, uh, our adults, the adults in our lives that being critical, being a tough, you know, kick in the butt coach um, is love. We're told that, that, that when authority figures and parents are afraid that it's, that it's love, they're saying, I do this because I love you. When mm -hmm. you're really doing it because you're afraid, it's not bad or good, but don't confuse love and fear because then I won't know who to be in relationship with. Because then when somebody does something to me that's that, that that I find unacceptable and they tell me it's from love, I'll go back into that 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 gaslit kind of place where I must not know what love is. I must be confused. I must oh dear. Can we unpack gaslighting while we're up? I'm just wanna say I'm really learning a lot today. <laughs> I hope everyone else is having as good of a time as I am, is what I want to say. What is, can you, can you really boil down gas? I feel like all these words is really why I want to talk to you about narcissism, but we're not there yet. You gaslit me. You get like, can you talk us through what gaslighting is? Cause I think that's exactly right. Is that people yeah. end up gaslighting us? I don't know if I said this to you before, but I encourage everybody to watch the movie. It's a good movie. 1938 Ingrid Bergman. It's 
it's actually it's called gaslight it's kind of it holds up it's a good old old movie right. um it's about a woman who marries a a, 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 a serial killer oh. and he she starts to get suspicious but he does all these things to try to make her feel crazy including turning the lights down and telling her that it's not happening turning the oh. gas lights in the house down so that's legitimate. where it comes from. So it's anytime somebody tries to make you feel crazy for what you're feeling instead of being curious and asking questions and understanding you. So if you got upset with me right now and I said, well, that's just this or you're, that's not really, I would be subtly gaslighting you. It doesn't have to be traumatic like with a malignant narcissist. It can be saying to a child, look on the bright side or the other kids weren't jealous. They or the other kids uh, didn't hate you. They were just jealous or um mm. well it wasn't that bad or hey here's a picture of, of me giving you a hug when you were eight see i was a good p parent it's trying to make you doubt your, your your sort your truth your 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 feelings who you are and so it's subtle it's small it doesn't have to be big and grand it's just anytime somebody's trying to talk you out of your feelings by presenting information ideas concepts that to you're try to, crazy uh, that yeah. you're crazy because then i yeah. think there's also tough times and I think you taught me this and thousands of dollars of treatment taught me this, but, and then sometimes people are just super uncomfortable with feelings. Right. You know, I was at dinner with a friend and he is, I really, I lost it, but I think in a good way, I don't know. Tell me what you think. And we, someone was drinking a glass of wine and I said, gosh, you know, sometimes I look at a glass of wine and I think if I want to have one and right. before the word one came out of my mouth, he was like, you don't want to have one. You don't want to have one ever again. You know why, you know mm -hmm. why you don't want to have one. And he goes, and I just stopped him. And I was like, I think this is right. Tell me. I said, you know, that really lacks empathy because right. that's m my experience. You're telling me what your experience is, but my experience and I, and I know enough, right. I'm a good therapist. And I said, you know, it sounds like it might be really scary to you that I would drink again. Right. Right. And the thing is I might have a craving for a drink and there's lots of things that I might do if that happens. It's not yep. so scary. And even if I drink again, there's going to be, as my friend Brad would say, there's, and Brad's therapist, there's a really good reason why. Right. And we'll figure it out right. you know, and you don't have to be scared of that, but you have to let me have a feeling. Yeah. And it was so clear to me that he was so uncomfortable. It was like, thank God, I, I mean, I've done this work. I think in a different lifetime, I mean, I would have probably flipped the table or thought I was crazy for thinking about that. That's right. I was uh, I was talking to a friend who was saying, he was really struggling with a depressive episode. And he was saying, I'm just starting to believe that everything I feel and think, everybody's telling me that I'm wrong. And it was small things like an opinion about a movie or an opinion at work. And I said to him, because I've known him for a long time. He's a close friend. I said, I'm so glad you're starting to see it. I'm so glad you're starting to, you know, I, I, I it's a joke in my family, but it's a truth that uh, I don't like mushrooms. And so when I say I don't like mushrooms. Like a delic or like cut, one, cut ones on pizza? <laughs> the regular ones that go on like <laughs> salads and pizzas and lasagna or whatever. Just checking. Put it's 2022. <laughs> uh -huh. And um, you can't say that you don't like mushrooms in a room full of relative strangers or acquaintances because people are going to try to talk you out of it try it with garlic try it sauteed you won't taste it and it's like when do i get to just that when do i get to an age where i get to say i don't like mushrooms and the people around me be like oh mm -hmm. cool let's, let's give you some without the pizza for you right let yeah. us order half cheese Brad. right right Right. Those are real friends. Those are the yeah. people you want to be around. Absolutely. Those are and the people you want to find. It is so rare for for to be in a group of people like that because we just don't it's not in the culture. It's not taught. It's not out there. I, I always joke about Star Wars. I'm a Star Wars geek. You know, we look at Darth Vader like he's this this great, fantastic villain, but he's just a, a, a metaphor for the world, which is the world is based in fear and control and anxiety and anger. And everybody has to think and believe and do the same thing. And that Darth Vader thinks Darth Vader thinks that he's saving the world. He doesn't think he's ruining it. He thinks he's saving it. He like wakes up from a nap. He like, he has, it's his only trauma. He's a very normal dog. He just wakes up from a nap. <laughs> Like what? in a trauma space. Go to your place, please. 
It's 2022. Dogs on podcasts are acceptable today. My dog is. Yeah. I love and accept my dog exactly as he is. Isn't that what you would want me to do? Yeah. I'm sorry that Danny interrupted our podcast, but while we're here, Mm -hmm. I need to tell you something. Mm -hmm. I was just sitting here thinking, did I have a cup of coffee during this podcast? Like what's happened to me? Cause I'm feeling so Mm. like my stomach's relaxed and I feel like I can breathe a little. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say to everyone listening, it's like, I think I just did what Brad would tell me to do, which is like, this is what it's like. I think when I say to people, call a friend, right? Call someone you love. We're not talking about my sadness. We're talking about things that you and I find interesting, like attachment wounds mm-hmm. and being your authentic mm-hmm. self. Mm-hmm. And I was just thinking like, it really kind of made me cry. Like the solution really is connection. Like hundred percent really. of the time. Yeah. The solution really is connection hundred percent of the time. And you and I both know whatever this, the context, whatever situation that we show up, um, we might have our doubts going into it, but but really quickly we remember that however I am is okay. And you know that about you too. And nothing makes you feel more alive. I even say this to couples. You will fall back in love again when you are allowed to be who you are and it's okay. It, it won't be about them changing. It'll be about them realizing that who you are is okay. And you'll be so surprised about how much the love comes back. And so Once you're allowed to be who you are, you have access to all the energy, all the magic, all the love, all the good Mm. stuff comes, comes out too, because it gets, it gets trapped when we repress the shoulds and the, and the, the shame, all the love and the energy gets lost too. God, I love that. And, um, okay. So if we found the right person or the right people, that's step one, then step two is starting to remove the armor. Like that's too, Tara Brock talks about that a lot that we've created this armor on ourselves and we're screaming so loud, but our armor is so good that nobody can hear. I mean, yeah, Molly Carmel circa, you know, 1995, but, um, what do you, then how do you start to remove the armor? Do you think? Well, this is going to be a little strange of an answer. Mm. I wouldn't encourage you to take it off until you want to. You know, I, I, uh, we have a slogan. In that is our, the most uh, Brad Reedy thing. Like, I'm going to tell that story in session. That's uh, the most, that's the most perfect, beautiful thing. It makes people uncomfortable when you say that because they're in such a rush to heal. I don't like how we attribute um, things like being vulnerable and we call it a virtue. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't like that because being vulnerable just means that you feel safe to be vulnerable. You feel safe enough to be vulnerable. And, Mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't think, um, we have a, we have a slogan in our program, which means come as you are. Don't, Mm -hmm. don't come and trust the process because if you've had trauma, especially from other therapists or coaches, you're going to have a distrust. I want to embrace the distrust, the walls, the armor, just as much as anything in, 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 in loving and understanding and embracing your walls and your armor, you will then feel safe to take them off. When I start to peel them off of you, or I have an agenda for you to take them off, you're immediately gaslit into thinking that you shouldn't be wearing them, that it's right to not wear them, to not wear it, and I should take it off. And you're immediately in the beginning of a cycle of self-betrayal, ironically. Ironically, when you try to speed your healing too much, it's re-traumatizing. Yes. Woof. Yep. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I don't usually listen to my podcast. I'm going to have to listen to this one. <laughs> Except it's really great. <laughs> Good job, Brad. Okay. So the point is you find the people, you sit in the back of the room, you honor your own time frame. Yeah. You honor your own time frame. Find somebody that you start to hear yourself in. Find, find somebody that, 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 that sp- find somebody that, that sparks it. And, um, experiment and be messy about it. And, um, you know, as strange as it sounds, you know, going back to the idea, like if you don't want to come and sit in the back of the class, you don't have to do that either. It's like this, Molly, I have four children, three are adults. And I've said for years, if my children need to not spend time around me to feel safe, I support it a hundred percent without qualification. Having said that, why would you not want to spend a, a time around a father who allowed you to be whoever you were, even if it included rejecting him? 
that's the easiest place in the world to be. You, they, 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 they gravitate toward me like flies to honey now because I'm okay if they're not here, if that's what they need. And so as therapists, coaches, psychologists, uh, sponsors, we have to be aware that if we start, if our agenda starts to eclipse the client, we lose, we lose the client. We lose contact with the client. Wait, you like never take it personally? Well, you do. And then you, you just say, apologize. No, like, you, you summed like, <laughs> come on, man. Dude, like, oh, with my kids? Yeah. <sighs> never. You're never like, oh, I wish you wanted to sit next to me. Yeah. I, maybe once in a while. I okay. Do. Thank you. But, it really. But abandonment isn't my fear with my kids. Oh, um, I have other, I have other mistakes. I make more regularly, more of oh, my okay. mistakes would be intrusive oh. than, a, you know, I would, I would overstep and over, you know, I would get triggered. My son, my oldest, I do this with him more than the others. Like I solve problems that he doesn't have all the time. <laughs> There's something about him and my, my, the regression that happens when I'm around him that I do this, what I can do when I get triggered personally. And if you get triggered by your children, quote unquote, rejecting you is you can just apologize and then re, re you know, redouble mm -hmm. on, on the work in that area. So if your children need you to be perfect, they're doomed, right? That's a Oof. fact. Yes. They just need you to be human and human means making mistakes, apologizing and working on it again. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, so, I mean, what I want to say, and I was thinking of a specific patient of mine, like she had a really a son that was struggling in treatment and this other one that she was just trying to keep up a face for. And I said, do you think he doesn't know? that you're right. sad about this, the greatest gift you could give him is to show him that you're sad because that yeah. allows him to be sad about this. And it's really, really sad. Yes, it is. Show him how to be a person. Yes. Wait, so while we're here, doesn't really, it, it's just what I want to talk about, <laughs> but I guess my podcast, your podcast. So here we are. that's the deal. But like everyone's using narcissism, like it's the worst word in the entire English language but it's just a part of us. Like that's narcissistic. I'm trying to explain this to so many people these days. I'm like, it's narcissistic because you're looking at it from your own experience right. of life. Can you just, because I think like everyone's just like, he's a malignant narcissist. You're a malignant. I don't even like, I'm like, I never heard of that term, but like, I don't think narcissism is like good or bad. I just think it's like a thing, but tell right. us about it. I mean, the narcissistic wound is the wound of not being seen. Mm. Um. And, and oftentimes the, the ones that we think of as narcissists, the kind of classic narcissists, um, the, the, what I love about narcissism is it's the best at hiding itself from the one who suffers from it. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it, it looks like arrogance, right? It looks like overconfidence. Um, and what it is, is a dramatic fear mm. of being alone or being annihilated or being nothing. Yeah. Um, and, and oftentimes in families where narcissism is, is, is produced or flourished in more significant ways, it's that people get valued for what they do for their pretty and smart parts, as I say. And when you, when you get value, you know, it's what it's, it's my favorite story about this is Bob Dylan, when his son, Jacob got a number one album in the 1990s mm -hmm. and a reporter asked Bob about it. And he said, are you proud of your son for his accomplishment, having a number one album? And Bob said, it's irrelevant. It makes no difference to me. Oh. And that, that tells you that Bob wasn't Bob's love for his son, being proud of his son, wasn't contingent on accomplishments. And so if we get seen for who we are, which is human beings, um, we, we, we have less narcissism. If we don't get seen or we get seen for the wrong things, valued for the wrong things, we think we have to keep that up. And so narcissism is everybody. Everybody's on a narcissistic continuum, more or yeah, less, just like no everybody's doubt. on the codependent continuum. There's no such thing as a, a non-codependent and 100% codependent. It's <laughs> somewhere in between. Same with narcissism. And the other thing about it is it's one of the, it's one of the last diagnoses that we're allowed to use as insult in our Absolutely. culture. Absolutely. And it, it's probably because, this would make sense, wouldn't it? that nobody wants to look at their own, <laughs> right. which is exactly what a narcissist would do. Right. Is your mother a narcissist? I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. So yes. am I a lot of the time. Like I yes. like, and even if you circle back to the beginning of this, like my fear, it's like, I don't yes. want to be seen a certain way. Like, yes, that is the narcissistic wound. I am, you are, some of us have it more than others. Some of us are stuck in it more than others. The, 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 
the the more severe narcissists can't listen and can't learn and can't grow but um but we're all somewhere in between we all right like there's a severity of it that's like because i i've seen this too where there's a severity of it where it's like yeah we're not puncturing this this bubble's closed it's right. closed for business right Right. But I don't know. I've treated a lot of people where like their kids have called them narcissists. And I've said, can we talk about it? Can I explain yeah, yeah. to you what's happening here? And I get to see the most precious part of the human condition, you know, which is like, hey, can I teach you how to have a little bit more empathy? Can we talk right. about how scary it is that you're scared they're not going to get into college? Right. And what that means and how you right, can do right. it differently. And these people don't know that there's another way to live. And I think that's a, a lot of what connection is about is just like learning from each other and experimenting off each other. Absolutely. Walking each other home. Find your people. That's what Brad Reedy says. And you know what Brad Reedy also says? If, you, if you're with people and you're scared, what do you say? Like, then they're not your people. Like if you're with people and it doesn't feel right, or they're not making you feel good about yourself, then they're probably not your yeah, people. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely something to be curious about and to look at because a lot of us have been conditioned to believe that if we're doing what's right for ourselves, it will be, an, it will be miserable. Mm -hmm. And I think that can be a really, no yeah. doubt about it, that can be a toxic, damaging belief to carry around with yourself. But we were taught it from our parents because, again, it supported that they were doing the right things, being good parents. And so mm -hmm. they were taught that we were taught that when we were upset, it's because we were fundamentally flawed. Mm -hmm. So I said this in the intro, but like, I hope everybody just wants to hang out with Brad all the time. I do it because I follow you very religiously on Instagram, Dr. Mm -hmm. Brad Reedy, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have this podcast, which you just, did you just have a million downloads? Two. Oh my God. Sorry about that. So two, two million, million downloads. Yeah. It's such a good, and listen, if you're a parent, double down. If you're not a parent, go. But if you're a parent, that's how Brad and I know each other. We work on really interesting right. cases together. That's really how we first met. Mm -hmm. And Brad is the person that like, when we don't know what to do, we call Brad Reedy when it comes to parenting. So get on that, even yeah. just for parenting yourself in my humble opinion. And that's the thing is I always, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, that it's for parents, or if you had a parent. <laughs> because I think we forget. Or if you didn't have a parent. <laughs> right. I think we forget that no matter how old and gray and saggy our skin gets, that we're still we're still the, just little children dressed up in adult clothing. Yeah, it's so true. God, do I feel that way most of the time. And then also you have like all of these programs. Like I'm just saying, go no Brad. I don't just spend time on the podcast pumping people, but I'm really your hype squad in my life. So I'm happy to spend lots of, but Molly. like no Brad, you have these like immersion programs. I sometimes one of my darkest times think maybe I'm just going to go to Brad's immersion for a week. Something will change. Yeah, I would love it. <laughs> that would be fun. Uh, I, um, I do, we have, we have uh, five day intensives for individuals, customized intensives for families and couples. Mm -hmm. We do it online since the, the pandemic kind of pushed us to, to try it online and it works, but we do them in, in Heber and city, right outside of park city, Utah. Yeah. I'm a friend of ours went, she changed her whole life. She had all these yeah. worksheets about herself after it, just to say you're the greatest. And also I'm so glad you're my friend. You're kind of the person I feel like very privileged to have as a friend, you know, like feel very privileged. I hope so y'all can kind. find a friend. I mean, it's just how I feel about you. I know you feel that way about me. It's just I such do. a lovely life we have. I and do. I love you. You've been it's there for me. It's some really difficult, painful, confusing times also. Yeah, it's easy. It's easy mm. to be your friend. Even if it wasn't easy, I'd still be your friend. Thanks, Mom. Hey, thanks for talking to me. It's the quickest 50 minutes of my day. And I feel so different. Gosh. Shout out to authentic connection friends as a skill. Just shout oh. out to it. Wow. I'm so yeah. glad I didn't come on and pretend to be what I wasn't. Yeah, me too. God, it really Very changed much. my life. All right. I love you. Love you too.